Welcome to episode 61 of this series about security podcast for October 24th, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research and Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius, at Purdue University. I'm Preston Wiley, and I'm joined by Keith Watson, and Mike is back this week. And uh, Keith will start off and give us our first uh, article. Okay, so this article is uh, about Apple's iCloud and some analysis that was done and presented by a security researcher by the name of Vladimir Katalov at the Hack in the Box conference in Malaysia, and this was last week. And basically, he talked about some of the protocols used in the iCloud service and how he was able to crack and do some analysis on that. So part of the problem is that while Apple provides a two-factor authentication system, it only offers it to a small number of countries. So if you're depending on where you live, you may or may not have access to it. And it also is only limited to specific functions in dealing with Apple, and, and those are typically when you make a purchase in iTunes. And also, if you're looking to change some aspect of your Apple ID, you want to change the email address or security questions or your password, anything like that. And finally, if you're working with Apple's tech support team to get some issue resolved, that's really the only time that it's actually asked for you to input that if you have it enabled. And so that's problematic there. But what Catalog was able to discover is that things like iCloud backups and some of the documents stored with iCloud are not exactly protected um, based on the two-factor authentication system. And they're no different than if you'd store them on any other cloud-based service. And in fact, there's, there's, uh, they claim that they're stored encrypted. However, the encryption key used to encrypt the document is actually included with the file. So that's problematic because Apple could cer certainly go and read your, your files that you have in the iCloud system, but could also respond to warrant requests from the government and provide the contents of those files to, to the government. So that's a little problematic there. So um, he would, uh, Mr. Catalog was able to demonstrate some of the problems just by having the Apple ID and password of a, of a user you could then go in and download their entire, entire iOS device backups. Um, and you could also get their clouds out of the iCloud and you know, anything they put in iCloud, basically. And they wouldn't, the, the user wouldn't be able to know that that had actually been accessed. So because you only have this two-factor authentication used when you're manipulating your account and not your files, there's no there's nothing stopping somebody uh, that would be able to download your iCloud stuff. So that's that's really the problem with that. And he goes on to talk a little bit more um, about some of the other issues with some of the protocols themselves. But I, you know, I see this as you know a concern because you have some assumptions that the two-factor authentication is providing some protection to your files, and that's not actually the case uh, in this case. So if somebody were able to uh, compromise your account credentials and steal your password through malware or, or phishing attempts or something like that, they would be able to basically download all your iCloud documents and have access to all of that data and you would know nothing about it basically. And even if you had two-factor authentication, especially if you had two-factor two authentication, it's not going to prevent them from doing it. So. Yeah, I'm, I, I knew this one Apple without the two-factor authentication and I was surprised at the time. It really protects three things. It protects you making a purchase in iTunes. It's uh, managing or changing your Apple ID, or if you're working with your technical support team. And that's it. Anything else you do, two-factor does not come into play. So I don't know. I think it provides a bit of a false sense of security. I mean, I've enabled it, but I kind of knew immediately that it's not really providing that much more protection, you know, because like this article said, you know, with the iCloud, it doesn't come into play. And as we've talked about on many, many episodes, we won't rehash it again. Passwords are not, not all that secure. <laughs> well, I think the false sense of security comes with that when Apple tells you your files are encrypted in the iCloud, but your keys are right there. <laughs> right there. I mean, right. 
That seems to me to be a false sense of security. Yeah. He's saying, hey, your files are encrypted on iCloud. When, well, that is true. They're, if you if you basically give somebody the password to your encrypted files right next to the encrypted files, are they really encrypted? I mean, not really. Yeah. So, I mean, kind of, yeah, that is problematic. And, and you know, if you compared it to other um, cloud-based services for file storage, I mean, if you look at Dropbox, Dropbox has a two-factor authentication option, which is used when you want to log into the website, when it's used when you want to access your account details. It's used even in the clients now. But there was a transition period where the first use of two-factor authentication really was related to the website and your account details. And then later they added the ability for that to extend into the clients themselves. So when you ran Dropbox on a new machine, you wanted to link that computer and you had to enter that. Now as your, as your, you know, part of your authentication was to add two-factor authentication. So maybe Apple is slowly moving towards that, given that they have a very large user base and they kind of pride themselves on having good design. Maybe it's just a slow process of rolling it out. We, we can hope that's what we can hope that that's what they're moving towards. Uh, I will say, you know, I've got a couple other devices, and they really do push iCloud. I, I don't currently use it, but you know, anytime you update your phone or put a new version on your iPad, it's like, hey, set up iCloud. And yeah. you know, it's like ah, maybe wait till you get it really ironed out before you push it so hard. And it, it comes down to this convenience versus security. iCloud is very convenient. Mm -hmm. um, so you always question security when something's convenient, but, but putting the encryption keys with the documents, that's just, I mean, that's just bad. That's just, yeah, I don't think there are any, I don't think there's any question that yeah. Apple could unencrypt your files and answer legal requests or whatever, because, I mean, they have to have the encryption key because you can use your iCloud on your, your computer, your your iPhone, your iPad, whatever. They, they work between devices. It's a cloud storage system. You can somewhat well, less if you couldn't share the files between multiple devices. So obviously they need they need to locally store an encryption key or do something really clever to avoid it. So well, I think they could have designed that better, but the question that I would have is, you know, what was the threat that they were trying to mitigate in encrypting it in the first place? And was it just a marketing idea that, oh, we'll just tell people it's encrypted and they'll be happy even though we'll have the key to it? Or was it some communication protocols that they use where they transmit the documents separate from the encryption key and then associate them later? I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's not, that's not uh, information that, that I have at the moment to say that's what they did or not. So it's hard to say. Yeah. But it does raise some issues with, with the iCloud service. Again, uh, Mike doesn't use it. I don't use it, even though we have Apple devices. Uh, well, Apple so seems... Well, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll say one more thing. Apple seems to focus on user experience. That's and true. From a user yeah. experience perspective, you don't notice that these encryption keys yes. are stored you know, with the files or all that. You have to kind of do some hacking in order to essentially discover this and get access yes. to them. Yes. But... And from their perspective, they're like, well, from the user experience, they're hidden. So, so true, the users don't true. know it. Well, that that's oh. then raises that level of, oh, yeah. uh, of trust when there isn't really any technical protection under their false sense of security. And stuff. Well, and um, I think this even came up at a conference you and I went to earlier in the week. Um, it seems like developers, and I'm one, user experience is a big part of it. And, you know, that's what sells your products. I mean, I'm not saying it's right to, to, to have these vulnerabilities, but the pressure is always on the developers to deliver a great user experience because all of these devices are very similar. You know, so they've got to do something to separate themselves. You know, marketing, user experience, they, they put a lot of energy into that. Um, and you can see in other areas where it's like, these things are hidden. Like you said, no one knows whether or not the encryption key is being stored with it until someone does some research, some hacking, and finds that there's a vulnerability there. But how much noise is this really going to make? I mean, I think this is just going to get washed into the background, like many other things do. Now, if, if you couldn't access your phone, 
that's what's going to make noise and get headlines. I can't get into my phone. My code, you know, I can no longer enter my code. That's the kind of things where the user experience takes priority. Right. Well, I think with Apple, the user experience takes priority. Yeah. You know, just period. I mean, you know, they could have encrypted the encryption key with a password. But they didn't because probably they wanted to make sure that users could recover their files if they lost their password right. and various other things. It just they think about well, what 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 is the dumbest user going to do? And let's let's make sure let's make sure that they they can they don't they don't do anything too dumb and well, make well, us look bad. I'll tell you some of the stories I've heard. You know, because people know I'm a software developer and now they know I have iPhones and stuff. Um, if they have iPhones, I, I've heard these stories where, you know, they, they've only worked through their carrier and they've lost data in the past. You know, they, they want to switch to a new phone and I don't know if the carrier couldn't understand how to do it, but they've lost data and they're like, I expect better from Apple. I expect that when I get a new phone, it's all there. Well, iCloud solves that. It makes it easy. So again, I think they were, they erred on the side of, I want to make it easy for users to upgrade. And of course, they want you to upgrade. I mean, you can see that in their upgrade cycle. That's their business model. Upgrade the latest, get the newest features, and we will make sure you don't lose a thing when changing between devices. So, um, you know, unfortunately, these things happen, and you hope they'll fix them. And now that it's, I, I think the researcher, uh, Vladimir, said, you know, he wanted to bring it to light so they could address it. You know, so hopefully, Hopefully they will. They're always quiet on what they're doing, so you just don't know. I mean, it could be that the next update they roll out. You know, the encryption keys are no longer stored on iCloud with the documents. Okay. We shall see. All right. Well, we'll we've talked about that one. So now, Mike, you can you can go to the next one. All right. Okay. So our final article for the podcast is on um, a court case out of Idaho where a developer. Um, working with Patel Energy Alliance, uh, working on this software, Sophia, left the company and started his own company where he wanted, uh, allegedly wanted to make the software open source. So the company, um, in pursuit to wanting him to stop this, you know, claiming that they would lose intellectual property, were able to basically issue a, a search and seizure on his computer uh, without any advance notice. And what it came down to in the legal documents was um, on his site, they, they posted that they like to hack. They enjoy hacking. And because of that, uh, the courts issued the ability for his computer to be seized on site. And, and I think they also were able to issue a temporary restraining order. Um, now, uh, for, for for our site, we'll post the legal document. There's, I, I've skimmed through it. It's a pretty long document, like legal documents are. Uh, but I thought this was very interesting because um, I know in our field, we've heard many different definitions of what a hacker is. Um, and true, it, it gets associated a lot of time with a negative connotation. But there's a group of folks that take a lot of pride in calling themselves hackers as well. Um, you know, they, they deem themselves as, you know, I'm curious about how things work. I like to hack inside. I like to figure out how things work. Um, and it, it just was very interesting to me that the court saw that word and said, well, you know, they basically said, well, someone's a hacker. They have the ability to basically, I think it was, they have the ability to delete data off their hard drive and cover up the trail. So we want to seize this computer immediately because they're a threat. Um, now that may or may not be true in this case. I don't really necessarily want to get into the facts of the case so much. Just the fact, but I, I find it very interesting that the, the use of the word hacker was enough for them to go ahead and issue this search and seizure. Um, and I was wondering, you know, if they would have said, "Well, I'm a, a cracker instead," or "I'm an IT professional," or "I'm a consultant," uh, we like to do consulting. Would the court have issued the same kind of response? Would they have allowed the uh, if their computers to be seized? Well, there was a there was a few months back a judge at one of the secret courts, the FISA courts, mentioned that he he stopped being a judge because he thought that it was a one-sided thing. You know, it was it was it was the government and a judge, and there was no 
there's no one to defend essentially the, the other side. Um, and I think in the case of warrants, it's, it's a one-sided thing. You have here, you have the the, the uh, person who wants the warrant, and you have the judge. And so, it's all it takes is the the person who wants the warrant to convince a judge that somebody is bad, and there you go. Yeah. So I mean, of course, they're gonna they're gonna portray hackers in the worst possible light that they can. Well, it's, it's and there are negative things about that. There are, is negative stuff about that word, and you can yeah. point it out on Google or the internet or whatever. So, yeah, it's really a, a definition of terms here, and some parts of the court uh, felt that that was a negative connotation, like we mentioned, and, and decided, well, we better jump on this quick, otherwise uh, that hacker might uh, yeah, <laughs> get right. away with something. Yeah. And that's that's problematic, certainly. And this guy seems to be just uh, a programmer interested in in developing this national security system that he had, Sophia software. And but I think Patel's issue was we can't sell it if you make it open source. So right. let's jump on this quick let's and let's use quick. whatever advantage we have in the court. And their lawyer said, well, he calls himself a hacker, right? I bet we could use that. Yeah, and and made the case that you know, and probably only the negative side, the negative connotation right. of the word, and use that as a way to argue in to get this uh, this stuff seized. So I can see that working, although I don't just, I don't agree with it. Well, we've we've seen. I think we even talked about it before that um, the courts are really kind of behind when it comes to technology, really understanding it, um, and. And that's not really a big surprise. So, you know, like I said, maybe their familiarity with the term hacker comes from the movies. You know, the hacker in the movies typically are bad guys, you know, doing bad things, bringing everything down. And incorrectly doing bad things. Correctly doing it. Right. Doing technically infeasible things. Yeah. <laughs> that's and, and as I said, it's a one sided it thing. Is. So, so, you know, this who. They didn't have a chance to defend themselves. It was sure. like, oh, we, hey, this guy, he could, if we, if we inform him that we're going to take his computer, then he can wipe all the data. He, he can wipe. So he's he's a bad guy. Guy. Now, now, I'm, I'm sure an IT security researcher, a cracker, a a programmer, or whatever, would have the the ability to do the exact same thing. Yeah. But would the court have done the same thing if he would have used? those terms instead of the word hacker. Yeah, I mean, the actual language is the court finds it significant that defendants are self-described hackers who say we like hacking things and we don't want to stop. They find it significant. So if instead they said, we are programmers and we like developing things and we don't want to stop. That would be an issue. Would? Because then it would be a company and you'd be impeding their ability to do business. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. I, I like I, making money. Don't, we don't want to stop. We don't want to stop. You know, they, they should be honest. You know, yeah. He was honest in a different way. Yeah. You've got to have a business plan, right? Yeah. But I, I think it's I, I think it's very interesting, and, and you know the reason I wanted to bring it up was because I, I've heard this at conferences we've gone to as well. This whole two sides to the to the term hacker, and, and to me, I just try to generalize it. I think generally, you know, a hacker, a cracker, uh, and I, a programmer, developer. There's, there's someone that's good with computers and have this technical knowledge. Now, what they choose to do with it really decides whether they're white hat or black hat, you know, good guy, bad guy. But I think those terms can be kind of interchanged somewhat within the field. It's, it's the intent. And, and what we know from this case, we don't know the intent. But I think the court basically felt that by using the word hacker, the intent was bad. <laughs> yeah, definitely much. And, uh, well, anything else to say on this one? No, nope, not really. Don't, don't call yourself a hacker. If you don't, don't, don't call yourself a hacker if you don't. Don't, don't, don't put hacker on your resume. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Put, put, put programmer. Put programmer or <laughs> business person or whatever. Security <laughs> professional or 
or whatever. I mean, I guess job creator. <laughs> job creator. That's probably the best title they can have as political advisor. <laughs> there you go. All right. And well, thank you, Mike and Keith. I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day.